Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by rockauto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 252. I am John Davis. Last time I looked and joining me today are two Whelan and a reporter and our writer and the road test uh, imaginer extraordinaire, Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Brian. Our over-the-edge reporter, Greg Carlos, who's also our producer of these podcasts, you lucky dog. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> And our assistant producer, Rachel, who has uh, some fascinating stories for us, I think, about her experience with some winter tires. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Welcome, Rachel. Hey, good to be here. All right. We're going to talk about uh, some cars, Rachel's tires, uh, long-term updates, and how we've been faring with vehicles in our fleet. Uh, Greg's going to talk about an upcoming Over the Edge segment. And uh, But let's start with, I think one of the most dramatic, I guess, and uh, least expected uh, concept vehicles to come out in recent months. Uh, It's called the Genesis X Concept EV, and you can tell a lot by that name. Uh, Greg, uh, unexpected, Uh, tell us about it. What does it look like and what do you think it means? Yeah, it's it's Genesis kind of hasn't really made many missteps since they've separated themselves from Hyundai. I mean, specifically with styling and this Genesis X, uh, you know, the letter X is a uh, supposedly an all electric grand touring coupe. Uh, it's, it'll be Genesis's first EV eventually, because this is a concept vehicle. Um, and it, it looks the part of a luxury grand tour. It's, it's long, it's low, it's, it's wide. The hood is just, super long yeah i mean looking at it right now from the three-quarter front it has a very long hood that it will probably be like uh similar to like a mercedes amg gt where you're looking like miles ahead of you in front <laughs> of that hood uh, but the big thing with genesis is that whole two line headlight light design right so here up front it starts at the grill and the grill is like a like an oval triangle where it has a grill I mean, yeah, that actually that, does have a grill. It has a big grill. For mm-hmm. EV, for those who aren't catching on to the joke, EVs generally now don't even include grills because there's no need for them. This has what looks to be a mesh grill, uh, but will ultimately probably serve no function. But this is, again, a uh, this is a concept vehicle. So, so from the grill, you look at those two headlights, which are striking, and they actually move all the way from the edge of the grill past the wheel well all the way on the fender to the door so this is a concept vehicle i don't think that's going to make it all the way to the door like it will on the uh or on the production version but striking nonetheless um massive wheels as you as you'd expect on a um concept grand tour and then you get around to the back and i'm kind of seeing a little aston martin db9 with the two the same two lights for headlights uh the way it wraps around it is compared exactly compared to the front where you have all these cool angles leading down to the grill i mean everything is very well sculpted you get to the back it's basically just like an oval and a concave Mm -hmm. oval uh but it's it's a timeless kind of classic grand tour design which i find really appealing and by all accounts i've read i mean everybody's just digging the crap out of this this uh design it's it's really wide looking i mean it's low and wide it sort of reminds me when you see the girth of it from uh, left to right a lot like a tesla model s brian robinson any uh any uh, impressions it's gorgeous for sure if you look at past genesis concepts like the gv80 especially uh they were pretty dead on to what the production version uh so if they can pull this off uh i think it would be amazing uh, definitely those headlights would be the uh, thing that would be uh, impossible to pull off. Uh, I still wouldn't say uh, impossible, but certainly difficult. But I think overall, it just speaks to the future of SUVs. I mean, you mentioned Tesla. Uh, it's just not a great looking vehicle. Um, but more and more with full EVs coming out, everyone's putting more emphasis on styling. And uh, this one looks fantastic. I'm not 
they didn't get into much detail on the powertrain, but I imagine it'll share that Kia EV6 that also came out uh, recently. I imagine it'll have that same yeah. powertrain, which is well over 500 horsepower. So it should be exciting. Any impressions, Rachel? I mean, this I'm curious because you are a different generation than the other three of us. Does does a car even interest you anymore? Well, for for well, for me, like cars is just what can I afford. But um, in terms of like styling, I think that I mean I love the headlights on this, and we'll see how much it actually translates to the real vehicle. But I was reading up on like the Genesis website and the and other people commenting on the car. And uh, they said that they want Genesis wants to continue those two headlights and just Double do that for basically for their new brand and like yeah. branding this new uh, branding new vehicles in the future. Um, I think that styling is important. And I do like that, as Brian said, like that we are emphasizing styling and EVs because, you know, all these companies are trying to go full electric, you know, early as 2000. 2025 so might as well make them look good you know to make them people make people want them greg what you know the interior was actually i think in some ways more shocking the outside was just dramatic and gorgeous interior is kind of shocking kind of describe what what you see when you open the driver's door so they stick with the whole driver oriented cockpit theme which is becoming more and more prevalent in um performance car really every car but here it's like when you sit in the driver's seat everything is aimed at the driver so you really separate yourself from the passenger not in that like you won't ever be able to converse with this person but all the controls the shifter the screens are pointed at you um which i wonder I how that's going to go over though it's well you know i think if if anybody's seen the core the new corvette interior right. it's very similar because it has sure. that same like not instrument, but but your your shifter, which I'll get to in a second, and all like the HVAC controls all kind of ride up to the dash. So but it's it, fine. Right, and it creates a barrier between you and the passenger. Mm -hmm. uh, but that shifter, like I was mentioning, it's, it's kind of a, a different design that we've seen. So it's, imagine your uh, dryer, your, when you turn on your driver and your dryer and set it to very dry, 30 minutes, whatever. It's that turning type, of shifter so you turn left for reverse turn right for drive and then you have a park button on top it's kind of like a new age and again i'm using another automotive uh thing people might not have seen but the uh the nissan leaf shifter which was kind of one of the early joystick style shifters it's like that in design but in function it's more of like a dial how about you brian where do you fall on the interior uh, i think it looks gorgeous um, I think everything is going to that pod type of area for the driver. Uh, materials look really good. Now, Rachel, you drive a, a, a car that's got a very straightforward, what they call a T-type dash. I mean, it's flat and then it has this, the center stack. So it uh, looks like a T. Do you find when you have passengers that do you think they would mind if you were more isolated and they were isolated from from the controls for the radio and so forth and so on i think in terms of the controls for any types of like music or anything um because usually you have something that's either a bluetooth or you know if anything connected by a wire if people want the music you know people always says like who's on the aux you just pass over your phone you pass uh -huh. over you know uh, you know, the actual physical thing. It's not really part of the car. So I don't think that would be much of an issue. I think the only thing would be like, how much are you talking to your passengers? How much do you want to like kind of hang out with them? You can feel like with some cars, when you're in the front, it's really hard to like communicate with people in the back. Um, so, you know, like road mm. trips or something that might be different, but are you doing a road trip in that car? Probably not, you know? I don't know. It's, it's pretty impressive looking. I just, we, we keep seeing all these gorgeous looking concept cars and people keep buying SUVs. So I don't know. Right. But, uh, the Genesis X concept EV, we don't know too much about the uh, powertrain as uh, uh, everybody said, but more to come. 
Uh, we're going to do something that we don't normally do on the podcast, and that's kind of take a pause and look at our uh, the vehicles in our long-term fleet. Now, for those of you that haven't aren't really up to speed on what that means, there are a small selection of vehicles that manufacturers loan us for a year, three months to a year, depending on the manufacturer. And these are vehicles that we generally liked a great deal in our road test, or they were award winners in our driver's choice awards, uh, whatever. They, it gives us a chance to see if the impressions we gather from vehicles after having them for a week or two uh, stay with us uh, if when we live with them day in and day out. So we're kind of going to give a little update on the ones that are in our fleet, and we'll take them one at a time. I guess I'll start off. Uh, Hyundai Palisade, a three-row SUV, uh, award winner for us. Uh, we, when we originally tested it, uh, we said that basically um, it delivered an amazing amount of uh, luxury, practicality, and comfort at a still affordable price, meaning that it undercuts uh, some of the market leaders like uh, the Honda Pilot and the, the Highlander at Toyota. Uh, so now after 15 months and about 22,300 miles, uh, it's going to go back. And I have to say, I've driven it most. Um, it has lived up to its billing completely. Uh, it's done well on fuel economy for a big three-row SUV, and it's pretty big. It's not quite Tahoe size, but it's large. Uh, around 24 miles per gallon. The all-wheel drive system has worked well in snow. The seats, which were hard at the beginning, are still hard, but they were never uncomfortable. The only um, thing that really bothered me during the whole time we had it is that would you, when you would engage the smart cruise control, it would also activate some of the electronic nannies like lane keep assist and, and so forth to keep you where you're supposed to be. And you would find that you felt the wheel just jiggle a little bit, even going straight. And I never quite determined whether that was me that was wandering in the lane or whether it was just the systems kind of talking to each other and maybe not quite figuring out. It wasn't big. It didn't disturb you. You got used to it. But Besides that, we had no mechanical issues, and it was a great vehicle, and that, and along with its sister over at Kia, the Telluride, they're, uh, they're just two really excellent big three-row SUVs, and uh, I, for one, and my family are going to sorry, sorrily miss it, sorely <laughs> miss it. Who would like to talk about the, uh, the next SUV, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, plug-in hybrid vehicle? I can hop on that one. Okay. It's, yeah, we've had that one a long time. It's pushing almost two years now. Um, but it's, I think we were all kind of skeptical with that one coming in because, I mean, it is Mitsubishi. They don't sell a lot of vehicles. They kind of get a bad reputation. But uh, it's a really good plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. I mean, we get 22 miles of range out of it when we do plug in, uh, which kind of becomes because it's not a fully electric, I think sometimes we get caught in the trap of just like not feeling like we have to plug it in because we can yeah. fall back on that range of the, or the, the, the gas motor. Gas engine. Yeah, but it's um, really, really comfortable after almost two years, everything's held up well. Uh, and again, the whole hybrid system has really been flawless. I mean, you can kind of, when most hybrids pick out you know, when it lags here or when it kind of gets, into like a hiccup mode where it doesn't really know what to do but this one's been solid since day one and i think everybody's enjoyed driving it not only just like around town for errands but on longer trips which usually isn't so pleasant in a plug-in hybrid surprisingly nice vehicle any other comments from anyone yeah uh, definitely the powertrain is a strong point for me it's been interesting that ours is a 2019 they updated it for 20 and updated even more for 21. It's got a bigger engine now. It's got even bigger battery. So you got more EV range. So they really uh, made a lot of updates to it, but they haven't raised, raised the price at all, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but with the new Outlander coming out in 22, uh, I don't think, have they said whether it's going to be a PHEV in that one as no, well? or not? They haven't, and they're continuing the one we've got for a while at least. It's, it, it's a totally different vehicle. It's now based on the Rogue. So there is a Rogue uh, 
hybrid, I believe. I'm almost 100% sure that it's coming. So maybe it'll, they're waiting for that. I'm sure they kind of have to stick with it because I, I remember years ago when they were really talking about it a lot, I'm sure they spent tons of money developing yeah. it and marketing it. So it's kind of like a big platform for them that they might just have to ride out for a little bit. Yeah. Any uh, comments, uh, Rachel, because you're one of the people that actually uses these vehicles for production day in and day out. Um, and, and if not the, uh, the Outlander, uh, we have the Kia Seltos, the Volkswagen Atlas Crossboard, and even the Acura TLX. Do any of the long terms fit what you do every day in and out 50 times with camera crews and so forth better than the others? I mean, I'm sort of liking it to how families might use them. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to say, in terms of personal use, the Kia Saltos seems to be my go-to. Um, I think it's also just it's here a lot. And so um, I usually take it on weekends, but um, it's a good size. It's not too big. It's not too small. So we can actually still use it for production. Um, but I always find it's like, I don't really want the monster SUV because I, um, you know, I sometimes have to, my like parking spots are really small. So I don't want the big, like, the Volkswagen. yeah. And like yeah. the Volkswagen's a little big, it's not too crazy, but you kind of feel it. But the Saltos, um, while still a crossover, still feels pretty compact, not too flashy. It's kind of fun. Um, the color's growing on me. I know a lot of people weren't a big fan of like the star bright yellow, but I think actually after a while, I, I kind of like it now. Um, in terms of like actual pro the production, um, I think the Volkswagen is probably the best, especially for interiors and exteriors, because that's when we have the most equipment. Um, we'll have our huge, um, our huge slider for the DSLR okay. and we have lights. So like the most space you could ever need, that is what we usually like on production. So I think that Volkswagen is definitely the go-to for that one. It's nice because it's this cross board. So it's a two row. So you don't have to throw down the third row. Right. We, I mean, we know we hardly ever use a third row for people. Right. Yeah. I, I love the cross board. We have that, uh, I'm not sure what the name of the color. It's like a pyrite dark slate gray. It looks really tough. It's got some big wheels on it. Uh, it looks so much better than the regular Atlas. Um, it's still got um, a really high seating position. Some of the SUVs we've had lately have kind of gotten away from that a little bit, I feel. Uh, this one, you really feel like uh, you're sitting up really high. Uh, ours has the two liter, which I still haven't fully made up my mind with yet. Um, it's adequate, by, uh, mm -hmm. certainly, but it, you can also tell it's working. Uh, I think with the six, maybe it would be a little more chill but uh, so far, I like the cross track a lot, or uh, cross sport. Sorry, cross sport. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll get Freudian to the cross track in a minute. Freudian slip. I was moving ahead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, while we're uh, before we get to the, uh, we have a new uh, long term or the Subaru cross track sport. Uh, and actually, what is this? The third cross track we've had. At least, yeah. Um, but I don't want to skip over which a car, the only car in our fleet at the moment, but it is a wonderful car. And that's the Acura TLX A-Spec. Uh, and of course, it's a, an all-wheel drive sedan. Um, you know, as much as we love SUVs and how useful they are, you hop in that TLX and it's like, wow, this is what driving is supposed to be like on an everyday basis, but comments. I mean, I don't know who spent what time in it. I think Robinson and I both have spent quite a bit of time in it. And I think we're kind of swapping it back and forth at the moment. Yeah. Cause it is, I mean, it's just for my needs and I do have a kid and it's another one on the way and um, it's fine. I mean, it, it's, it's tight to get a kid seat back there, but so it's the, it's also tight getting it into a compact SUV. I mean, it's just like, I'd rather have the driving capabilities of this TLX over some of the compact crossovers we've driven recently. Yeah. Yeah. The more I'm in it, the more I like it. I, I, we gave that our best luxury car driver's choice award. And I maybe wasn't fully on board with that when we did it, but uh, man, I think it was a great car. It's a fabulous car. It has, you know, a really techy feel to it. It's not just a luxury car. Um, it can get a little noisy on wide open throttle, uh, but it's it's kind of in the right kind of noise. It sounds more aggressive than annoying. 
And one of our uh, producers actually uh, did a very quick dash to the West Coast and back from the East Coast in it and um, drove through some her all that horrific uh, snowstorm and bad weather that hit Texas uh, in February. And um, he was stuck in traffic, but he never had a problem with the car mm -hmm. losing uh, the all wheel drive system, uh, use, losing traction or anything else. So uh, it speaks well for an all around really impressive uh, luxury sports sedan. Uh, who wants to uh, approach our newest uh, Subaru Crosstrek? I just got out of it today, actually. I had to swap for a, uh, we have a Mercedes GLS I'm taking to the track tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you're into Crosstrek, it's very familiar. <laughs> they, yeah. they didn't do a ton with this new update. Um, we Probably have didn't have to. I mean, it's a terrific little vehicle. Well, yeah, Subaru owners and fans are all like, they know what they like. Yep. And Subaru just gives it to them. Uh, and, and that's fine. I think it's gotten, their interiors have gotten a lot better. They're very easy to use. They have the volume knob. They have the tune knob. Everything's big. You have rubber mat. So for a family and somebody who doesn't like to, you know, be on eggshells when they get into a car, like that's what a Subaru is for. Could it have more power? Sure. I always love more power. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I did kind of hop out into traffic from a, from a stop. And it seemed better, marginally better than a previous cross track, but better nonetheless. I think there's a reason it keeps taking home a, an awful lot of honors from the automotive mini media year after year. I want to now move to Rachel because uh, you did something that we haven't done on the show, frankly, for a long time. And that was not just a tire test, but a uh, an extended winter tire test. And uh, your car, uh, you were nice to volunteer uh, to do the test with it. So why don't you tell us a little about uh, what the tires were, uh, the process, and what you experienced. And, and we caution everybody, these are not snow tires. That's a term that doesn't mean anything anymore. Mm -hmm. These are winter tires. That's what you buy today. And they're made for extreme conditions. And this year, we had one of the worst winters we've had in a long time in the, in the mid-Atlantic. So uh, it was uh, well-timed. So Rachel, take it away. Well, it was very well-timed because actually when we started it, um, I think the first time it snowed, I was like, I have to get all of my footage. Like, I have to, you know, make sure I do all my testing right now. Because, you know, and sometimes uh, in Maryland, you'll get one small snowfall and that's it. But uh, time and time again, I had my friends, um, I'd, you know, be driving this or that and someone would be like, oh, but it's snowing out. And I'd be like, I have winter tires. So I was really excited about that. And it came in handy a lot. Um, and, you know, there were days where we had to come in and do road tests and there was maybe like two inches of ice, like on the road coming into work. And uh, if I had my regular tires, you know, I don't know if I would have even attempted it. Um, I live like in my neighborhood, I have um, a lot of street parking. And so I will be doing like uh, in a lot of parallel parking on hills. I think I mentioned that in one of my um, my standups is like I would actually, you know, be coming out of a snowbank and I was doing fine. I think I did almost every single condition. Um, I did us, the, before yeah. we go any further, these were new Goodyear tires. Yes. Brand new. So what were the, what was the, do you remember the name of the tire off the top of your head? It was a command. Ultra command. So ultra, it was the command. ultra command Goodyear winter tires. Right. And this is their, uh, it, like completely brand new tires. It's their, uh, their top of the line, new winter tires. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, I pretty much did every single condition, a lot of slush, um, literally pure ice. One time when we were doing drive-bys, I uh, backed a couple feet down a hill in three, like three inches of snow. And I was kind of a little worried that I was gonna have to call someone to haul me out. No problem. So this was the year to have it. And um, I can see why people compare, you know, tires to the proper footwear because you don't really notice or you don't realize how much that can make a difference until you get in those situations and then you see how much they really do. 
Now, I should point out that uh, Rachel drives a, a com front wheel drive compact car. And we chose her because that's a, the most typical type of vehicle. Uh, of course, it's being overtaken by SUVs with all wheel drive, but where you need the extra traction most is in a two wheel drive vehicle. Uh, did you notice how different did it drive than the tires that were on your car, which were original equipment tires? Um, so actually, I recently switched my tires back, and I and I definitely felt I felt a difference the second that we switched both times, and um, they did feel a little sturdier, like a little kind of more to it. Um, which ones? Which, which oh, one? Sorry, the the winter tires, oh, the and. Winter. Um, you could tell that the acceleration is slower, which mm. which is good for winter driving, but you know, it does take a few more seconds to get up to speed, like let's say on the highway, um, for at least like fast acceleration purposes. Um, and I did notice that my miles per gallon were going, at least in the very beginning, it was, you know, only a few difference, but by the end, you know, I used to average, let's say 36, and I was averaging maybe like 30, you know, okay. so it ended up to be a bigger difference by the end. Um, I did feel the most uh, difference though in braking. It was really aggressive. And mm -hmm. um, especially if it was kind of just like, a, you need to make a quick stop, someone kind of breaks in front of you. It, I kind of was like, oh gosh, because it just kind of had a really grinding feel. And uh, so I made sure to give myself a little extra room for everything after that. Just cause I didn't like the feeling, you know, so. But, but overall, since you'd never really tried winter tires before, did it make you, do you think it's a good idea? If people live in really snowy climates to, to spend the money and make the change. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really about your comfort level and do you need to go out in those kind of conditions? Cause if, you know, if you are able to telework without a problem, you know, then then, telework. then yeah, who cares? But um, if you actually have to make those trips out, there are plenty of times where I wouldn't have made the trip if I wasn't confident in my tires, because there's nothing worse than getting stuck somewhere or slipping like that is a gut wrenching feeling. You feel your car, you know, uh, flip and slide and stuff. So honestly, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, if that's what you're going to be doing and you're going to be in a weird amount of climate, definitely make the switch, especially if you're in a sedan or I used to drive a, um, a Honda Odyssey, but like a 2010 and it was terrible. Like it was, it was, a, it was an older one, but my old car would be, you'd come off of a stops, like a stoplight and you'd slip in just like rain. So that was, <laughs> that was a little bad, but. Well, OEM tires, which seem to be all season tires, you know, the joke is they're really not good for any season if they're good for all seasons. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's pretty typical. Before I let you go, you also have a, um, shall we say, uh, interesting story about how the uh, tire retailer reacted when you were switching back to your uh, OEM tires. Oh yeah. So I recently switched back my tires into my regular, my regular standards. And, um, I was coming off a road test and, uh, anyone who knows anything about Goss's garage right now, it's being, um, during the winter months, we use it for like snow and, um, we, we like what, um, Salt, and like salt. Yeah, storage. We have it cleared out for the Goss set. So everything is in two compact spaces. And, um, and the right side was where I left my tires before it's been like four months and, uh, I'm pulling in and it was real quick. I'm thinking about all these things running late, of course. And so I run in, I see a stack of four tires, beautiful, perfect. And I just throw them in my car <laughs> and, um, I get to the, the Goodyear place. store. Yeah. I get to the store and, um, they call me back and he was like, Hey, you're going to need some new tires. And I was like, the, no, I don't like these were pretty brand new tires. Like, you know, my car's a 2018 should be fine. I went, and kind of all these scenarios are running through my head. He was like, uh, you should come look at them. And I come to my car and he flips them 
and they're completely run down. One has like a gash in it. Bald. And immediately, <laughs> immediately, I was like, these are goss set tires because on the show, and I actually worked some of the goss sets um, this past year. We have a lot of demonstrations of like, don't use this kind of tire. Like you need to get this changed. And it was literally a set of four Goss tires. And immediately I was like, oh my gosh. And uh, thankfully they were, oh my gosh, my color is crazy from this computer. But um, thankfully they were a slow day and uh, MPT wasn't too far. So I went back and I called one of our producers and I was like, hey, did someone switch my tires? And they'd placed it in a completely different location. Finally, I literally called, like rolled in, saw my new tires in the other section. And I was like, okay, (laughs) this is better. All about communications. Well, yeah. oh you know, we all make, we all do things like that. The hurrier <laughs> I go, the behinder I get. Thanks, <laughs> Rachel. And we should say the tires were uh, loaned to it, were actually provided to us by uh, Goodyear for the test. Uh, and um, they turned out they did a, a good job for us. Yeah. Okay. The winter tires, a real good idea, regardless of the brand, if you live in snowy uh, climates. Greg, you've got... Uh, it's not winter, but it is pretty rough going. Uh, over the, you have an over the edge segment about a, a classic uh, Land Rover. You want to tell us a little about it? It's coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'll try to do it uh, somewhat quickly. We had a nice long discussion on all of our long termers, which is good. Yeah. Um, so, I I got to drive something that like I'm probably the most excited I've been in a car, or should I say, truck in a long time. And you can actually see, I went back looking through my in-car commentary and I was like, I was super excited. It was because it was fun. And it was a 1955 Series 1 Land Rover. So the one that started it all, which is cool in and of itself. Big square, square and all aluminum. Yep. This one was a four cylinder and like maybe topped out at like 60 miles an hour if you're lucky. Uh, But this is like the the quintessential go anywhere do anything type of land rover that they wanted to build their brand on and quite literally it it did and so this one in particular was called oxford that's its name because in 1955 six college students from oxford university and cambridge university took two of them they were loaned to them uh, from land rover they went from london to singapore which is about eighteen thousand miles it was the longest overland trek at that time took them six months they recorded the whole thing interestingly enough uh, david attenborough was just getting started with the bbc so he loaned them tape and there and he said shoot some stuff and send it back if i like it i'll use it and i'll keep sending probably was it was film wasn't it was it film yeah it was film. yeah yeah yeah. because you really didn't have tape i'm so i yeah i'm so used to interchanging different words because we don't (laughs) shoot on film anymore it's all digital but I say film, I say shoot, I say we don't tape. shoot on tape anymore. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, uh, the two made the trip. They made it to Singapore all in one piece. I mean, they had issues along the way, and I'll show some really cool footage from from back in the day, real archival footage of some of the bridges and passes they had to go through. So this was in 1955. Fast forward a few decades, it went here, it went there, it eventually fell into disrepair. 2017 it was found and restored as close to original as possible because the frame had rusted out they had to make some modifications next thing you know i get an email saying it's in maryland and i'd never heard of it they sent me a backstory on it and they said hey you can drive it so we took it to uh one of our off-road playgrounds in annapolis and they let me tool around in this thing for about an hour or two and uh it was it was awesome i can't imagine spending six months in this thing i mean a couple (laughs) minutes was was fine enough but uh the fact that it it, i mean the story is incredible and now so it did the whole overland it actually in 2019 went back from singapore to london then came to america it drove across america met us in maryland and then like a week or two after that um it's, I think it went to New Zealand where it might still be. And the, the whole goal is to keep it running for every continent. And I got to be on a very small portion of that tour. So it's really cool. I can't wait. It sounds like a great segment. You know, really, when you think about film and how perishable film is, uh, and probably wasn't even transferred to videotape until, I don't know, at least the 70s, maybe. 
uh, it's pretty remarkable that that's that survived. Yeah, I mean that that's really part of the why the story is so cool because it wasn't a given then that people would document a trip like that. And this was a, I mean, this is a true overland trip going through places that weren't civilized. So not only were they making the trip and documenting it through journals and things like that, but they actually had tape, which is why it's, or I'm, I'm sorry, film, film. which is uh, why it's so cool. But the uh, David Attenborough connection is pretty cool too. All right. Thanks everybody. Let's move on to our lightning round and Brian Robinson, I'm going to ask you to, to comment on this first. And here we go. We happen to re be recording this podcast on April the 1st, but the April fool's day shenanigans in the auto industry started a little early for Volkswagen about three days before April 1st, Volkswagen decided that in the U S they were going to change their name from Volkswagen of America to Volkswagen of America. And that's in honor of the fact that they've said that within 15 years, they're gonna be an all electric car company. The German automaker published a press release and took to social media, claiming that it had officially changed its name in the US to Volkswagen and a nod to their future plans. Now, I'd like to note that this move was in fact a joke. It was an April Fool's joke. It just came out around what? The rumor started, I think, on uh, March 27th, so people hadn't thought that far ahead yet. Considering the, considering the proliferation of misinformation on the internet and VW's own transgressions, what is it a good move for the brand in this country? Volkswagen. Yes, Volts, V-O-L-T-S. Thank Volts you. Volkswagen, yes. Uh, I assumed it was a joke when I saw it, but then the more I thought about it, the more <laughs> I wanted it to be true. I'm like, this is the most brilliant thing I've heard in all my time at Motor Week. Like, why, <laughs> why wouldn't they do that? That is so genius. But mm -hmm. then I found out it was definitely a April Fool's joke. Uh, but as much as I want it to be true, it's still a good. It's still a good thing. Anytime you get people talking about your brand, I think that's a positive thing. It, so it kind of worked on two levels there because the electrification, and then the fact that most people call it Volkswagen anyway. They just pronounce it TS. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I you know I I read a couple of articles, and maybe I'm just not deep enough of a thinker. Uh, but people were like, well, considering the fact that they had lied about the emission scandal or the emissions oh. with their diesels and everything like that like it, it they shouldn't have done it i don't know man like it was I, a I, joke I, folks like like robinson said and, and i had my doubts like people they was actually airing on national news saying that that okay. they had done it but i the whole time i'm thinking don't you realize april fools is like just around the corner and you know, this isn't the first time an automaker has done it. Usually it's something smaller, like they're going to come out with their own brand of like cat helmets or something like that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this was a, I think it's fine. You know, it, it got the people talking and it, like Robinson said, it very well could have been true. And I would have just been like, okay, it's, it's Volkswagen now. Well, I have to admit when I first saw it and, and it leaked, I think on the 27th or so, I thought, well, okay, it's, I understand it. They've got the new ID4 of their first all electric vehicle. So I'm curious, Rachel, were you fooled or not? So I, I was kind of, I guess I was on the fence about it too. I saw it and I, I, I what's funny that Greg said that like Volkswagen, Volkswagen, like people actually pronounce it like that. I kind of agree. It was like the first time I was like, oh, it kind of makes sense. Like, and I think that was kind of, it would have been a cute, like, actual PR stunt for them to like actually rename it. Um, I did see that it did mess with the stocks a little. And so that might be one thing that might be detrimental with them because it raised their stocks 5%. And, uh, but now that they went back on it, everyone's kind of in this, you know, the stocks market been the stock market has been kind of crazy anyway. And so I think that that actually might put them into some little trouble. I don't know, no. you know, the specifics on that, but I think if it was but, a smaller PR stunt, it might have been, I guess, a little easier to manage after. Like if, like if they had come out today on April the 1st with it yeah. by 11 o'clock or something, you said no, but yeah. giving people three or four days to think about it gave people entirely too much time. 
at, yeah. at least the head of the company isn't like saying they're going to take the company private on social media and all yeah. kinds of stuff like yeah. that. That's true. I'm not going to mention any names, but I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. So uh, if you have a Volkswagen, you still have will be able to buy a Volkswagen, at least for a while. You never know once they've made their switch to uh, maybe they were testing the waters for when they finally do make their switch to all electric. But uh, that was uh, I, I do think that we all need to relax and be able to laugh a little bit Take a joke. both ourselves in this industry. And I think it, it provided some much needed levity. Uh, I, I'm just amazed at the number of people that are so upset about it because they took it seriously. Lighten up, folks. All right, do we have a viewer question? Yes, we do, from Jay. Very nice uh, comment, says, enjoyed the show. Thank you, Joe. Now, he would like to see us demonstrate that three or four golf bags can fit in a trunk of a new vehicle or the front compartment if it's an EV. Uh, his uh, it, reasoning is that he goes golfing with his buddies and when it's his turn and he's driving an Audi A5, he'd like to have a vehicle that uh, can easily accommodate uh, four golf bags. I don't know what you think, guys, but four well, golf bags, well, even even the travel bags, that's a pretty tall order. Well, I chose this question because golf is very near and dear to my heart. I'm a, I am an avid golfer, so I get the frustration. I, I don't have, I have maybe two golf bags I could try to throw in there. Uh, but what I do want to get out there is that I've, back to a previous comment, I've been in so many compact crossovers, subcompact crossovers, just because you are in a crossover, an SUV, it doesn't mean you're going to get more space for golf bags and other things. Good, good I've had so many times to put down the rear seats just so I can get one golf bag in there, let alone two. So I'd say do not throw out the idea of a sedan. I'm not sure how you're going to get people in an A5. That's the coupe. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, if, if you move up to like an A6, uh, you could, I, I can't say for sure, but I'd say you get at least three golf bags in that trunk. As far as like frunks for the Model S, I think you can get maybe one down in that yeah. frunk and then you have the the cool the hatchback out there. Um, but I will say, while we haven't done any specific tests, I could certainly maybe work something out where I have one that specifically can fit maybe four golf clubs in there and maybe show it, I don't know. Brian, so, what do you think? Yeah, what's the question? He's just wondering why we haven't done that or what? I think so. I mean, uh, the, he's wondering, he would like to see us demonstrate that vehicles can take more than two golf bags. Mm -hmm. And I should back up and just explain to people, it's kind of a, an inside industry joke when you're showing a new vehicle that it, it, it can fit two. I mean, General Motors, I think, was the one that may have started that. And so that's just not enough for him, I guess. I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to actually go that same direction. That used to be every time you go with all these events, it would yeah. be how many golf clubs can you get in the back? But now everything's, I don't know, I, I guess golf is still as popular as it was, but now everything's made for uh, people with active lifestyles, which include like mountain biking and backpacking and all that stuff. So now when you go on these events, you know, they show that you can fit a mountain bike in the back or, or whatever. And uh, they seem to have forgotten about the golf clubs. I guess they're aiming for a younger, more athletic clientele than someone that rides around in a golf cart. Well, give me four and I'll try to fit it on the next road test. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Let me the, know. <laughs> the stipulation is that I then have to play around. So I think <laughs> it's, we have to work something out with a local golf course. So Jay, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to try and meet your uh, uh, requirement. I think it's going to be a little tough for us. But the fact is, there are very few vehicles that aren't big SUVs that can fit four yeah, golf bags. In. That, that was actually going to be my main point was like, if you if you're seriously, if that's a serious consideration for yeah. you, like you're think midsize SUV and above. Q7 honestly. folks, huh? Something like that. Yeah. Any rat and raves for anybody as we get towards the end of our podcast? Anything? Right. Uh, go ahead. I have one because okay. this one has been bothering me more because last year um, 
we owe you to only see it maybe in a few luxury brands or performance cars, and it's the automatic tightening seatbelt. And I hate it. I really hate it. Mm. <laughs> and That's just for me, per- for me personally, I just, um, I don't like it to be too tight on me. I like, like I'll always pull it, but it was kind of every time, especially as a road test person, um, I'm constantly hopping in and out of the car. Like, when I'm doing GoPros or anything like that, I have to run out and every time it er, er, and it just keeps getting it. Now they're going to be more standard on a lot of the daily drivers, which we've seen more in 2021 cars. So that's my big one. I'm not a fan. I know it's probably more of a safety thing, but um, I'm also a person that's just a nauseous person. So having another super tight thing on me just like mm. isn't my favorite. So that's my big rant. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's odd, it's odd because my wife also does not like it, and she's very touchy feely. I'm not very touchy feely, and I like it. It's kind of like a hug. It's like a nice hug. <laughs> Maybe I've, it's the hug I've been looking for my whole life. Good. Yeah, I'm not touchy feely at all, but it is like a warm embrace when you get in the Mercedes, See, I, and it like snugs it, <laughs> snugs you up, and then just lets go a little bit, and it's like ah, oh, okay. Oh, uh, I think there, there's something to this, Robinson. I feel well, like this has turned into much more personal than I expected. This might be like a socio, like a sociological experiment. The well, thing is, I'm I'm also a very touchy feely person. I'm very much an affectionate person, but man, I do. I think it also surprises me every time, and it's just that extra like tug and mm. ugh, nope. You know, since we're on seatbelts, my problem is not so much the grab; it's that if they they ride up on your neck, that's the thing mm. that I hate. It's just like yeah. it, it becomes very irritating. But yeah, uh, thank you, uh, all the safety advocates, for giving us seatbelts that make you feel like you're in a, a torture chamber at times. <laughs> so on, on the other hand, obviously, some people like it. So, <laughs> what does that say about us? All right. I think that's probably a pretty good place to wrap this one up. Thanks everybody for being a part of uh, our podcast number 252 uh thanks to rachel brian and to greg and thanks to all of you out there for joining us uh, today uh and listening to us or watching us and speaking of watching we want to make sure we invite you to catch motor week every week on your local public television station and if you're uh, have lost us and can't find us it's pretty easy to find us go on to our motorweek.org website at the upper right it says about the show Hit the tab, pull it down, put in your zip code of your city, and your local station will pop up with the air times. And it's a, a very accurate uh, description of when we're on, and we're seen all around the country. If you can't hit us up there, then Tuesday nights and throughout the week on the Motor Trend Cable Channel, you can also find us. Or you can find everything we do over on our youtube.com slash motorweek channel, including a lot of our uh, Uh, flashbacks and uh, classic road tests and uh, we invite you to just basically you can just everybody's uh, binge watching these days well if you go there you can certainly binge watch motor week Uh, (laughs) please join us there on any of the social media we're there for every screen you've got and we'll have another podcast coming up in a couple of weeks until next time i'm john davis thank you all for being a part of motor week You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by rockauto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.